We are going live again this time. I am very fortunate to be catching up with Robbie Orber, who I know very, very well through the harness racing world, but I know he also has a greyhound world as well. Robbie, thank you for joining us, mate. A very good evening to uh, the both gentlemen, Troy and Paul, and to everyone tuned in tonight. Can't believe I didn't turn my volume on it on it again. Um, Robbie, I wanted to... Deja vu. <laughs> I wanted to get you on to... Um, the idea of what me and Troy do, we promote what we do at Bendigo a little bit of the crossover with Lord's Raceway and the likes. And we thought, well, with the Saturday mornings, um, trots and dogs, try and get people to understand some of the participants out there and all the rest. And Troy said to me, oh, is there any questions I want to ask him? But you do have a, a crossover with the Greyhound world, don't you? I, I do, um, Paul and Troy. I actually uh, called the Greyhounds for Sky Channel for two years, going back uh, 1997 to 90. I called at Olympic Park and Sandown, called uh, most of their feature races at the time, the Australian Cup, Melbourne Cup, uh, the Top Gun, and always had a, a love for the Greyhound world. And I used to, uh, as a teenager, it was nothing for myself to turn up at Olympic Park on a Monday night with uh, some of my old schoolmates and used to enjoy the dogs and even go out to Sandown on Thursday nights. And we used to go to the trots at Mooney Valley, we used to go to the races. Uh, there wasn't a, a race meeting that went through the week that we probably weren't there because we loved it. <laughs> Sounds like a familiar, familiar upbringing. <laughs> <laughs> you, you, caught, you, you caught a pretty handy dog too in that era, mate, in the Sandown Cup, am I right? Uh, yeah, look, we, there, was, there was a lot of good greyhounds. Um, Rapid Journey at the time was a, a top greyhound that we called uh, him Winnie. I had the pleasure of calling Bold Trees. He was certainly one of my favourite greyhounds of all times. I mean, he was just an amazing stayer. We actually had quite a number of uh, video stories back then for uh, Greyhound Racing Victoria. Arthur Cooper, who was uh, now calling uh, over in Europe, Arthur was the main caller and uh, Arthur and Danny Malecki and myself were very, very good friends from uh, at a young age, and we, we were all involved. Jan uh, Danny was at Channel 10 there for a while, and uh, the three of us sort of put quite a number of video productions together for the Greyhound World, and uh, we used to publicise them and advertise them through all the commercial television stations, and quite often Channel 7, Channel 9, the ABC used to run a number of our stories through their sports programs, and it was all derived from promoting greyhound racing for the greyhound racing Victoria at the time. Outstanding. And you you currently work, uh, is it the Meadows you do a little bit of work for? Like, obviously not right now with coronavirus, but prior to that you did a little bit of work there as well, Robbie? Yeah, I sort of felt I was retired from the greyhounds. Believe it or not, the last time uh, when I called my last race at the time for Sky Channel, uh, I can't really say I actually went back to the Greyhounds. I just, obviously, my, my passion and my first love was always harness racing. And Jess Tubbs uh, went over to work for the Meadows. And obviously, I've got a great uh, friendship with uh, with Greg Sugars and, and Jess Tubbs. And Jess asked me whether I'd come back and do some hosting for the Meadows. And obviously, the people that are still involved at the Meadows in Eddie Caruana and a number of the, the committee people and, and Mark Long were the same people that were involved back at Olympic Park when I used to call the Greyhounds going back over 20, uh, 20, you know, 25 years ago. And they were um, so receptive to myself coming to the Meadows and doing some hosting work. And one meeting turned into two. And then before I knew it, I was doing about eight, eight meetings of hosting throughout the year. And all of a sudden now I'm, I'm back even calling some Greyhound races, which has been quite amazing. It's been an amazing turnaround. But I've always loved the Greyhounds, always had a, you know, I really enjoyed it. I've enjoyed all racing codes, but uh, yeah, it's, it's been fun. It's been a lot of fun. How's all you? Um, talk about fun. Troy uh, sent me a message the other day. Saturday racing, like you're racing. We're racing tomorrow um, in Melbourne, and then at uh, Melton. Just so people are aware, there is two different codes on the TAB thing, but. Um, Troy sent me a message mid-morning about Dan Malecki's calls, Robbie. I was working horses and didn't get a chance to actually listen to them. But um, Saturday morning racing is a bit of fun, isn't it? It is. It's a, it's a new audience. And obviously, Harness Racing Victoria, with their endeavours in growing uh, the industry, but in particular from a wagering perspective, there's a window of opportunity for the international space. And obviously, we've done a lot of work with Europe, with the trotting gate over a number of years and that sort of dropped off which will certainly get reinvigorated over the next six months 
And there was a window of opportunity to get into the American market, in particular on a Friday night, and especially right at this point in time with the COVID-19 situation, there's not a lot of uh, sporting activities happening in the US. So there's a little bit of a, a starving, uh, punting audience that wants to actually invest on uh, having a bit of a bet on different codes. And we, we had a look at the opportunity of beaming our races into the States by racing Saturday morning. And it was a huge success last week. Uh, it was uh, something completely different to all of us. And, and Dan was at his brilliant best, I must admit. Uh, you know, I'm obviously a very close friend of Dan and him and I chat you know, regularly uh, this afternoon, we spent uh, the afternoon walking our two dogs and watching them have a swim in the lake together. And we're looking forward to tomorrow, uh, Saturday morning. But the first race last week, of course, was won by a beautiful woman. And, you know, the, the catchphrase of Dan when the horse went over the line, there's no better way to start off a Saturday morning waking up to a beautiful woman. So I, I must admit, I had a bit of a giggle uh, to myself and thought, my, my, my first response was, well, Dan obviously has had his wheat fix this morning. And <laughs> as, the, as the morning uh, progressed, the, the calls kept getting more uh, exciting and more imaginative. And uh, in particular, when we got to race five and he started to bring in the kangaroos and then there was the dingoes and then the snakes. Uh, it, was, it was quite amusing. It was very amusing. He, he's, a, he's, he's an amazing man, absolutely. The most highly talented race caller I've ever known. That audience that you speak about, they certainly would have had uh, a lot of the, the colourful calls that Dan produced. They're not used to that type of activity on the microphone. No, and in particular when you're beaming over to the US, uh, the US have quite, you know, their race callers fall far short from our race callers. But one thing that they are is they're very decorative in, in, their, in their language when they're trying to uh, make a race exciting. And Dan probably... Uh, utilise that space to expose our racing to the States and at the same time uh, getting the attention of the audience uh, here in Australia that listen to racing and I was too scared to ask him this afternoon, um, have, you, have you prepared for tomorrow morning? I, I sort of said to him last Sunday, <laughs> I go, I don't know what you're going to do for next week but you now, you, I said, you realise you've set the bar and there's going to be all these people expecting uh, a, another uh, high level performance with your calling tomorrow and I didn't ask him today, but I can guarantee without asking him, he will be ready to throw in some absolute pearlers tomorrow morning. So I'm, I'm telling everyone to tune in uh, from the first race all the way through to race seven tomorrow morning because Dan will be at his brilliant best. I'll bet on that. I'll take a dollar ten that he'll be at his brilliant best. <laughs> Do you know? Um, do you know who's doing the, the Ballarat Greyhounds? And if they're under the same pressure now, they might have to try and lift the bar in the, into the same mode. <laughs> it's a bit of fun isn't it I think at the end of the day uh, look, we all love racing and we like having a punt we love winning but at the same time we, we do love the game and when you get a race call that it can bring a lot of excitement and emotion to a race call it, it does it gets you excited because it gets you involved it, it makes you listen a little bit more attentively to what's going on and racing's fun I mean for most people We've got, we, you know, a lot of us are insular in the sense that we work in the industry, so it's a job and we're very heavily invested with, with our investments. But for, for the majority of people, racing is a, a casual enjoyment, part-time thing outside of their normal Monday to Friday jobs. And racing should be fun. And that's what we're trying to do. And Dan certainly does it at his profession at an amazing level. To guy uh, calling Benny Go Grounds today, Troy Hull, he does it as well. Ronnie Hawkswell, he's um, some of these guys. They can slip in just little things. In the, I don't know how some of them do it in the middle of a call. Sometimes I tell you, it's uh, they get they do a great job. I, I call the odd trial, but uh, to nowhere near the standard of uh, those guys, that's for sure. I think it's a great thing, mate. One of the other reasons, Robbie, we got you on was for 13 questions, which we ask um, just so people, the Grand guys. Obviously, would have found out a little bit more about you beforehand, mate. Uh, maybe a lot of people would say, well, geez, I didn't know that. But um, hopefully with these 13 questions, we might be able to get um, get to know you a little bit more as well, mate. Are you going to fire Harley or am I? Um, we was. This is the first question. To cut it back to 12. The first question is, have you been to many race meetings the other coast? You know, yep. Been a stack of them. So well, I'll, I'll kick off with question two, mate. Have you owned a brain out? I have. I've actually owned two greyhounds. So the first greyhound that I owned was a greyhound called Arbuckle's Pride. Uh, and 
it, it won a couple of races. It, it wasn't much good, uh, but I had a funny story with that Greyhound because uh, one night I had a very big win at uh, Mooney Valley on a Saturday night. Got a quaddy and it paid, you know, in the four figures. And when I was 18 years of age and it was four figures, it was a, it was a pretty good result. And I had my Greyhound in it uh, Tuesday night at Warrigal. And this was Arbuckle's try. And I thought, well, you know, when you're brave and bold and pretty stupid at, at 18 years of age, you think, well, uh, let's just keep rolling the dice here and see how we go. So uh, I decided to invest my whole quaddy uh, winnings on uh, my Greyhound Arbuckle's pride. And uh, nothing's really changed much in the last uh, 30 probably 35 years or so, it ran second. Uh, so I, I, I gave it back pretty quickly. But it was fun. It was fun. It wasn't fun at the time, but I look back now, it was quite fun. And the other greyhound uh, was a, a greyhound called Rational Miss, who was a, an absolute star greyhound uh, at the time. And you'll understand why I've never raced another greyhound since this day, because Danny Malecki, uh, myself and Arthur Cooper, Again, uh, in our 18 years of age, Danny might have been 16 back then, um, and we decided that we wanted to get a greyhound. So at the time, they had uh, a sale on where they were selling you know, puppies uh, at Sandown, and the three of us uh, were able to save up $1,000 between the three of us. We all had you know, about $330 each, and uh, we had a gentleman by the name of George Butis who um, was a very astute trainer. He was at Warrigal. He trained a, a top greyhound called Alf, and he recommended that we buy this pup. And unfortunately, at the sales, it went for $1,600, which was $600 more than the three of us could afford. So we thought, well, we, uh, George said, look, I'll, buy the, I'll put in the extra money, just try and find a few extra friends to put in the extra $600 to get this pup. So... That night, it was uh, one of our friend's birthday, so we thought we'll go out, surely out of the 16, 20 people that are there, we'll get a couple of people to put in, you know, $300 each to buy this pup. Well, before we knew it, there were uh, 20 owners in this greyhound. Everyone wanted a share in the pup. And, yeah, the story was that she went on and won about 25 races and probably back then about 50000 which probably for us was nearly close to half a million dollars back then. And I thought... Never again will I get another good greyhound. So I, I never bought another one after that. <laughs> did you, um, did you, um, sorry, I'm going to have someone walk through my back door on, on it. Did you split it 20 ways or did you guys keep your, 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 your main? Oh, no, we, we, we split it the whole 20 ways. Yeah, it was, it was the most dumbest decision that we made. <laughs> we made a few dumb things when we were young. Don't worry about that. <laughs> um, How did you get started into harness racing, mate? Yeah, look, I, I was just uh, addicted. I, look, both my parents, uh, Italian heritage, uh, absolutely no involvement in racing whatsoever. Uh, growing up as a young kid, and when I say a young kid, I, I was literally four, four years of age, maybe five, and <clears throat> my parents used to watch Channel 7 on a Saturday night, and there used to be a television show called The Penthouse Club, which was run by Michael Williamson and Mary Hardy, and it was a, a variety show. It used to come on at 7 o'clock, it used to be the news at six. They'd have the uh, half hour best quarter of the day from the uh, VFL footy at the time. And then the penthouse club used to come on. And mum and dad used to watch it mainly for the music and the variety. And every half hour they used to cross over to the showgrounds and uh, the late uh, Bill Collins and also, of course, Ray Benson, who were absolute stars at their trade, uh, used to come on every half hour. and. I used to watch these horses go around on the TV in black and white, and I loved it. I just thought it was the greatest thing ever. And I used to cut little pieces of paper up on the floor, and I never used to have toy cars because my, my parents were you know, quite struggling financially. So I used to cut up little pieces of paper, and I used to play on the floor when I was five years of age and used to pretend I was calling the races at the troughs at the showgrounds. And... Um, my mum and dad used to think there was something seriously wrong with me because they thought, how does this kid love the racing so much? So my dad then took me out to uh, the showgrounds a couple of times when I was very little. He had no idea. He could hardly speak English back then. and um, I just loved it. I, I don't know why. I just loved it. And then when I was 13, we moved. We lived in Hawthorne. We moved to uh, Bulleen. And you couldn't have picked a better neighbourhood because I had two neighbours who were heavily involved with the trots. 
So I became family friends with those two people and um, they used to take me to the races all the time. And from that, I got involved uh, working horses when I was 15, 16 years of age uh, on weekends, school holidays. I was just addicted, loved it. And I went overseas when I was 21 for six months and I thought to myself, I used to try calling the races when I was a little kid, five years of age. I, I should go back and, and give it a bit of a go. And obviously I was good friends with Danny and Danny started when he was virtually uh, in nappies when he started calling races. Uh, and I just thought to myself, well, I'll have to give it a bit of a go when I got back from uh, my Europe trip, which I did, but I had a lot of juggling professions that I was dealing with, which not much has changed now, mind you. And, um, yeah, I just love racing, just loved it, always have, it's been in my blood. Two things I love, footy and racing, and nothing's changed. <laughs> Are you, I'm, I'm suggesting you've, you've owned a, a few handy horses. What's your favourite horse you've had and why? Uh, there's a pretty, I've, I've been lucky, I've, there's, there's two very special horses in my life, but there's no no more special horse than Bella's Delight. Um, she, she went on and won... Uh, three Group 1 races. She won the Breeders' Crown final and she won two Vic Bread finals, but she competed in quite a number of other Group 1 races. We went to Perth with her in the in the Mayor's uh, Championship over in Western Australia and she finished second in that final. Um, we're, we're, we've been very lucky. She was a very special horse. So I've still got her and it was a very special uh, night for me uh, on last Wednesday, which was actually my birthday and Bella's Delight's first two-year-old had her first start at Kilmore. Um, her name was LaBelle Bijou, and unfortunately, uh, racing uh, has some really good moments and also has some really bad moments, and uh, she, she galloped, and it looked like she was going to hit the deck, and thank goodness she didn't, uh, but she's now my pride and joy being uh, my first two-year-old out of my champion mares, but she's a very good filly, and she's going to win a lot of races, and we're, gonna, we're really looking forward to watching her, but Bella's Delight... Uh, she finished off her career, as I mentioned, winning three Group 1 races, and I bred her, and I've had four, five generations of the family. So it's been a long journey, and yeah, she'll, she'll always be my champ. And, and little Nikki Nono, um, she was one that I went and plucked out of the paddock and don't really buy yearlings, but I uh, took a punt on my own judgment and, and purchased her, and uh, she went on and won a Victoria Oaks final. So she won two Group 1s. So I've had... Two very, very special horses, and I've had a lot of other horses that have done really well for me, uh, but they haven't reached the heights of those two girls. Funniest thing you've seen on a racetrack, mate? Uh, there's been, been been lots of different stories. Um, probably, I think there was, going back many, many years ago when I was young, Stephen Dove, I think, was driving a horse at Kilmore one, one night, and I think it was probably 100 metres from home, and the sulky came detached from the horse and the horse uh, was going to the finishing post without the driver oh that was pretty funny I thought <laughs> that night um i think bluey bluey matson there's probably been a few good stories with bluey matson over the years of uh, a few of his uh, great punting wins um i think there was one night he, he sort of fell in the dust sheet and he must have had his last uh, last cent on it and um he was he was still reaching uh from virtually the canvas of the deck uh trying to tap the horse on the rump to make sure it got over the line and uh, it did win. So <laughs> there, there was a lot of stories. Um, on a personal basis, you know, I mean, I think it was when I was very young, there was, I had a funny story uh, as a race caller. I think I was calling it Mill one day. And uh, back then there weren't broadcasting boxes. So there were virtually wooden stands that you'd stand up, you know, very high up in the tower and call the races. And this day uh, it was very windy and I had a, had a can of, uh, I think it might have been a can of Coke or a can of Solo, and I had it up sitting on the stand, you know, on this open stand way up in the air, and the wind came along and it sort of knocked my can over and um, the drink sort of went over the, the, the ledge and there was this poor gentleman standing at the bottom of the ledge and the whole drink was falling over his head and I realised what had happened and I actually picked up the can and I was trying to hide behind my binoculars and on the stand not to look over the edge to know that it came from the, uh, from the race caller. But, look, there's, there's lots of stories, but, look, uh, you'd probably spend quite a few hours me talking about them all. Hey, so what's been your biggest win on the punt 
aside from that quaddy when you're 18? Uh, probably my one of the best ones that I've had. Uh, again, I was fairly young. I laid out eight dollars once on the quaddy. I took two by two by two by one for a dollar, and uh, that paid sixteen thousand. And the horse that won the last leg uh, was a horse called Country Duke, which was yeah. trained by Russell Thompson, uh, won the Shepherd and Cup. And I came on at the time pacing extra on the Friday night and it trolled at Kyabram. And I used to get uh, the lovely L- L- late Lynn Chambers, she used to mail me the, uh, the, the trial results from Kyabram. And she just came through in the mail. Uh, and I looked at the times and I thought, Wow, the way this horse has gone at Kyabram, it was almost a, a track record. I've never seen any times. I used to call the picnic meetings at Kyabram. Uh, it used to be Marutna and Elmore. And, and I thought, well, wow, I said, and this horse went around in the Shepherd and Cup and I, I came on pacing extra and I made it my best bet. I thought I'll just be, I'll, I'm always quite happy to tip in the big odds. And I said, this is the best bet of the night. And I think everyone was laughing at me. And it got up and won. And... Um, for, for my eight dollars, uh, I, I won sixteen thousand. And there was another night uh, I had a very, very big win at uh, at Mooney Valley during one of the big nights of the carnival. I'd seen a horse called Hush World trial at Cranbourne on a Saturday morning, which uh, Lee Everson trained. And Ericles was in the race, came over from New Zealand, and uh, I backed. Hush World at a hundred to one, and it won, <laughs> and and I won quite a bit of money. <laughs> Brilliant. And, you, you, and, I, and I will say I was working, I think I was working on Channel Thirty One back then, and um, I tipped it to a few people, and you never see me cheer a horse home as much as I cheer that one home. Let me say it was pretty good. Well, I've got a few good stories. I could tell you some good, good punning stories, but I think we've all got those. Favorite. There was one night. Of, I, I have to tell you this one because I thought it was a pretty special one. I know Paul Males and I uh, had a horse called Swing Blade, and um, we took him up to Harold Park, and we thought he had a really good chance. Um, and there was three of us. There was three of us. Uh, we, we 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 all put in, and we had a. Thousand dollars each way on it at thirty-three to one in the uh, Tatlow final at uh, at Harold Park, and it got up and won. So that was a pretty big night. We had a stretch limo waiting for us at the end of the night. Oh. It was a very big <laughs> night. Favorite, your favourite track no longer in operating, and uh, your favourite current track. The one no longer in operating would be interesting. Uh, I love Naya. Naya is a very special place for me for the harness racing. Um, again, probably you always relate uh, favourite tracks to your best wins. Um, and I think we, we took about, over the years, we took about four horses of mine to Naya and I think we came away with three wins in the second. And so it was always a special place. But I, I love the atmosphere of Naya. It's just one of those little country tracks where you picturesque and only recently we went to, actually I took Dale Brown uh, and Steve Bell and Luke Spano to uh, Nye. They, they hadn't been there. Uh, I mean, Dale had probably worked there as a uh, steward, but the other two boys hadn't been there before. And on the way home from Mildura, we were heading to, uh, to Swan Hill. So we stopped off at Nye, and that track hasn't changed one bit. The, 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 just, it was just special about it. It's close to the action. Um, obviously, the showgrounds had some great memories for myself, um, but probably from a current day perspective, when, when I look at punting, uh, I love punting at Shepparton and I like betting at Maryborough. I just feel both those two tracks uh, give horses every possible chance. If you, if you feel like the horse is superior to what they're racing against, you can bet with confidence. If they're good enough, they'll win. Very good. Good. Uh, What's the best horse you've seen? Best horse I've seen, from a harness perspective, again, look, growing up, I mean, Popular Arm was something very special for us growing up, and I suppose you always connect that that passion of when you're a young person, and I, I just still remember the days of 
going to uh, Mooney Valley. And the, I still hadn't even had my licence back then. I think I was just probably 16, 17, 18 years of age. And he just had that explosive romance about him. Just when he let down, he just, just took off like a rocket. But look, there's been other horses since then that have been you know, better than popular arm. But from, from an era perspective, um, he was always very special. And because he also had big crowds back then, um, you know, the, the, the cheering and the emotion that went along with it was always very special. Um, and one of my favourite horses has always been Blossom Lady. I, she was a, a mare that just, you know, won a hundred, few hundred cups. And a uh, hundred cups always been a special race for myself. And uh, I always had a great love for Blossom Lady. Um, but probably from a more recent time, I, I probably relate a horse of the calibre of I'm the Mighty Quinn over in Western Australia. I mean, his explosive speed was just phenomenal. I always compared him to a horse of popular arm and even a horse like Hector JJ. I mean, speed is very, very special to see when they let down and take off. So, but look, popular arm would be my best. What's your best dog while we're on the same question, mate? Uh, bold trees, bold trees for sure. Like um, he, he just had just an amazing romance with the greyhound people. The, the crowds that he used to bring to the tracks was absolutely phenomenal. He'd get back to last. He'd be giving greyhounds such a huge start, and everyone used to just ride every every stride he took. And one by one, he'd pick them off through the field, and he'd weave his way through the field, coming from last and he used to know where the line was. He literally used to get up so often right on the line. It was just like he timed his run. And he was a very special greyhound. Probably from back in my era growing up, he will be a greyhound that I'll never forget. Very good. You up, Hales? No. Um, I always get this question. I don't know why. Most unusual, be best or biggest race meeting um, you've attended? What's the most unusual meeting you've been to? Oh, no, look, I think anyone that's been to a Melbourne Cup, uh, you, you, with the thoroughbreds, it, it, it has to be the most amazing race day of, of any, um, of all three racing codes. And look, I was very fortunate. I worked for 12 years at Flemington for Flemington TV and worked there not only as a, um, as an, as a person conducting interviews, but also emceeing some of the presentations early days and then working out of the betting ring and to, to turn up there at at seven o'clock in the morning and leave the track you know at seven o'clock at night and just to see you know a hundred thousand people so many dressed up in costumes and getting in the spirit of things and by the end of it you'd be walking over bodies as you uh, walked out of the gate because they were uh, totally intoxicated and you'd see the ones that be dancing and singing uh, just a great day. It's 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 special. It's 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 something that the country needs to be very proud of. It's it's a great day. And what race would you love to win? Look, my love for harness racing. Um, I've always said it. The day I win the Hunter Cup will be the day I probably stop racing horses. Um, it's just always been a, a special race for myself. Um, just growing up as a kid. I mean, I know. You know, we talk about the Inter Dominion and we talk about the Melbourne Cup from a thoroughbred point of view. But I don't know. I just love the the romance of the Hunter Cup being a long distance race. I mean, I was really disappointed that we changed it to a mobile. I, I used to love it being a standing start. I love the distance of the 3200. It was a, a genuine horsemanship training ability to get a horse away from a stand and then prepare your horse to to run a distance that not many would run over. So. That's the race I want to win. I will never stop uh, owning horses until I win the Hunter Cup. <laughs> That's a big thing. I don't really want to ask this question, being a Carlton man, but what's your favourite footy team, mate? Well, I was bred and born in Hawthorne. I, uh, I was bred uh, 200 metres away from Glenferry Oval. You'll never find anyone that's more entrenched with the Hawthorne Footy Club. I, I went to school at Hawthorne. I, I used to literally go and watch the players train on a Tuesday and Thursday night. I used to join in with their sausage sizzles. Sausage sizzles. Uh, my, my, my biggest, uh, uh, I suppose, the, the love I had for a, a guy by the name of Peter Crimmins. He wore number five, and number five is my lucky number, mainly because of Peter Crimmins. 
uh, you know, I was this little blonde-headed kid growing up, went to school, you know, at St. John's, which was only a few hundred metres away from Glenferry Oval, and we used to have a lot of Hawthorne players used to come down to the school and visit us and be part of our footy curriculum, and back then, there used to be not much school getting done, it was always about sport, um, so I just love footy, uh, played footy, coached footy, still do it uh, today, and... I just love it, and yeah, I love the Hawks. What's your favourite beverage, mate? Uh, I'll probably boil you. Um, probably from a non-alcoholic beverage. Um, if I don't have the coffee first thing in the morning, I'm not very. Uh, I, I need a coffee to get me started. Um, coming from an Italian family, we we uh, we were we, we never used to sort of get brought up with milk. We used to get brought up with cappuccinos and and, and lattes at home. So. It's something that I uh, I have my percolated beans. I, I go to the uh, Genovese factory uh, at least uh, once a month and get my big one, two kilo bags of beans. I I, I think I fancy myself as a bit of a barista, to be honest. But um, it's probably a, a job that I'll do when I'm when I'm retired from racing. I'm going to be a barista. So, uh, if, if you want a good if you want a good coffee, come and see me. I know how to make one. <laughs> Your last ten or six a day, so I better, I'll, 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 I'll keep you to that. <laughs> Your last last ten dollars. We've only got about three minutes left of this show too, but that's okay. Your last ten dollars. How would you spend it, Robbie? Uh, if, if anywhere near a betting agency, um, if I went to <laughs> casino, anything that had number five on it, I would put it on five. If I was near a tax lotto agency, I'd use the Powerball number five. And uh, if I was at the races, uh, I'd probably look better than it's number five. It's about thirty three to one. I'll have a crack at it. But yeah, as long as it's got number five attached to it, that's where it's going. <laughs> Robbie Orba, you've been great. As I said, we're just a little bit um, low on time with the Zoom meeting. I thought, oh, we'll have plenty of time. But you can tell a story. We might have to get you back on again. Hopefully, both the Greyhound guys have got to know you a little bit. Most of the trucking guys know you, that's for sure. But um, I'm sure there's a few Greyhound guys out there that got to know you a little bit differently. That's for sure, mate. Um, good luck tomorrow. Any of the Greyhound guys want to view what Robbie does in between races, go to www.thetrots.com.au. Um, it's up there above Rob's head on the on the picture. And, uh, yeah, you'll be able to get to see all the interaction, parade rings, and everything going on at, um, there tomorrow morning. But tune in. Watch it on Sky Active, I'm sure. The Ballarat race caller, he'll be pulling his socks up tonight, ready to take on Dan. It'll be a bit of enter <laughs> morning entertainment, that's for sure. Outstanding. All right, boys, thank you very thank much. You.